Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two-player game, Radlands, designed by Daniel Pichnik and published by Roxley, who helped sponsor this video. Water is life, and here in the Radlands, it's scarce, and the little bit that you have, you'd better make last, because rival gangs are coming to take what's yours. To survive, you'd better take the fight to them, and I'll show you how. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. There are a few different versions of the game, and in this video, I'll be using the Super Deluxe Edition, which comes with a couple of playmats that I thought would help while we're learning. But just know the playmats are not required to play if you happen to have a different version. Have the players sit across from one another, and if you do have the playmats, set one in front of each player. Then get out the cards with this back and shuffle them into what is known as the camp deck, dealing six to each player. Each player examines their own camps privately, picking three of them to keep, and the rest they return unseen to the top of the camp deck. And once both players have made their selections, you can then return the camp deck to the box. It won't be used for the rest of the game. Each person now sets their chosen camps face down into the row closest to themselves in any order they choose. And once both players are ready, they flip them face up. For your very first game, instead of having new players pick their starting camps, they recommend you give one player the garage, railgun, and supply depot, while the other collects the reactor, cannon, and victory totem. Each player now collects one of these water silo and raiders cards, setting them face up into the spaces for them here, and then collect and put a player reference nearby. These are the water discs, and each player will now collect three of them and put them into this area known as their water supply. Between the players, put the black extra water discs, and then shuffle and set the cards with this back into a face-down pile. Instead of placing the extra water tokens in a supply between the players, if you're using the playmats, you can divide up the extra water tokens and have each person set three of them here. I like keeping them between the players, so that's where I'll put them during this video. Each person now checks this area of their camp cards and totals the values shown. They then draw a number of cards into their hand from the central deck that equals the total that was showing on their camp cards. In this case, I'm showing a total of three, so I will draw three cards. And my opponent's showing a total of two on their camp cards, so they take two. The cards in your hand, you'll keep a secret from the other player, but of course you can examine them yourself anytime you want. Now take one of your water discs and flip it. If you get the water drop, then you're the first player. Otherwise, your opponent is. And that's the setup. In Radlands, you'll be playing gang members from your hand to protect your camps and attack your opponents. Destroy all three of your opponent's camps, and you win. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player and then going back and forth. And on your turn, you'll perform three phases, starting with events. Events are a type of card that have a black and yellow border, and any you have in play will be in this column in one of the spots labeled 1, 2, or 3. You don't start the game with any events, but let's assume it's later in the game, and we had these two in play. At the start of your event phase, you resolve the printed effect here on any card in this number 1 position. And once it's resolved, you discard it to a face-up shared discard pile. Then, whether you resolve the card or not, any other events in that column move forward one space, so this one goes to here. We'll discuss how you get events a little later, but after the events phase, you then move to the replenish phase of your turn. You always start every turn with exactly three water tokens, unless you're the first player of the game. On that player's very first turn, they start with just one water, so they should move two of these water tokens to this discard area. But on all future turns, players start with exactly three water as normal. Starting with less water balances out the benefit that the first player gets for taking the first turn of the game. Either way, after you've ensured you have the correct amount of water, which for all other turns will always be three, you then draw a single card from the deck and add it to your hand. Then you move on to the final phase of your turn, actions. And there are five different actions you can take. You'll find the types of actions you can take listed here on your player reference. And this will also provide other helpful reminders when learning the game, so be sure to refer to it. During the actions phase, you can perform any number of actions in any order, any number of times, as long as you can pay any of their required costs. So let's go through each of the types of actions, starting with playing a card. 
There are two main types of cards you'll come across. Persons, like this one, and events. Events you can identify because they'll have a black and yellow border and a bomb symbol in this area. Everything else is a person. To play a person or event, you pay its cost in water, which is shown here. And let's say I decide to play this vigilante. I set it in front of any one of my camps, and your camps have room for, at most, two cards in front of them. I'll put it here, and then you place the water you spent to play that card onto it. Placing water on a card does a couple of things. First of all, you now know that water has been spent for this turn, but also any card with a token on it is said to not be ready. When a card is ready, you can use its special abilities. When it isn't ready, you can't. A card's abilities are in this area, and when a card is first played, you won't be able to use its abilities since it will always start with tokens on it, unless the card says otherwise. For example, here it says that this card enters play ready. So even though it has the one token on it from paying its cost, its effect can still be used right away. We'll look at how you use abilities a little later, but there are a couple of other rules to explain about playing a person card that we should go over. When adding a new person, if there's already one in the column you want to add it to, you put the new card in front of it, or you set it behind by sliding the other one forward. And of course, as usual, I'd have to put the water I spent for it on top. As soon as you have six people in play, you can't add any more until some are removed by other effects during the game. Now, instead of playing a person, you might choose to play an event. And just like playing a person, you have to be able to pay the water cost shown here from your supply. You then set the event into the space of this column matching its bomb value, making sure to add the water that you spent onto it. Now, you'll notice this one costs four water. At most, you always start your turn with just three, but as we'll see later, there's ways to get additional water that you can spend during your turn. An event does nothing when it's brought into play on one of these spots, but remember, at the start of each of your turns, it will advance forward. And if an event is in this space at the start of your turn, its effect will resolve, and we'll talk more about the various effects later. Though I should mention, only one event can be in each space. So if we had one in the first spot and then wanted to play this, which would normally go into the first spot, we'd have to put it instead in the first available spot behind it. And if there were no empty spots behind it, it couldn't be played. If an event has a zero value, it's not placed on your map. Instead, you resolve its effect as soon as it's played, and then you discard it. This means you won't be able to put its water cost on the card itself, so you instead set that water you paid into this discard area. So that's how you perform the play card action. Now we'll learn how to perform the action that lets you use an ability on a person or camp card you already have in play. A person or camp's ability can only be used if it's ready. A card with a token on it is not ready, but as we'll see at the end of your turn, you remove all tokens from your cards, making them ready for future turns. So let's pretend it is already the next turn. For a person to be ready, it must also be upright. When a card gets damaged, as we'll see later, it gets rotated sideways, and that means it's not ready and can't use its ability. Now, a camp is a little different, because even if it's damaged, it is still considered ready, and its abilities can still be used. You'll find reminders of what makes a person or camp ready right here on your player reference if you're ever unsure. Let's assume we do have a card that's ready and we want to use its ability. Abilities always have a black background and will have a water cost shown here at the top. You pay that cost onto the card itself, and then resolve its effect. Now, we'll learn about the effects later, but remember, once a token is on a card, it is no longer ready, and that means its effect cannot be used again this turn. This means if a card has more than one ability, you can only choose to resolve one of them on a turn, since after you pay for and resolve an ability, the card will no longer be ready. Some abilities, like this one we see on Rescue Team, may have a zero water cost, but even they can only be used once per turn. To show this, after resolving the ability, you then take an extra water token from the supply and set it on the card with this side face up to show that the card is no longer ready. In addition to abilities, which are always shown with a black background, sometimes a card will have what is known as a card trait. This will have green brackets and a white background, and instead of having a cost you need to pay, the trait is resolved when the card indicates. In this case, we're told this trait happens when the card is played. Some traits have ongoing effects, which can occur multiple times, but all traits on a person are ignored as soon as that person is damaged. 
Camps are the exception. Their traits are always active, even if it gets damaged, and you're reminded of this on your player reference. As we've seen, many effects and abilities have icons, so now let's learn exactly how all these different symbols work. This symbol simply means you draw the top card from the deck. So here it's telling us to draw four cards, and then we have to discard three of them. There's no limit to the number of cards you can have in your hand, and if you ever run out of cards in the deck and need to draw more, just shuffle its discard pile into a new deck. Resolving this symbol gains you a punk, which means you draw the top card off the deck without looking at it. Then place it face down in one of your columns. A punk is just a generic person with no special abilities. This is the symbol for damage, and unless the effect says otherwise, the damage must be assigned to one of your opponent's unprotected people or camps. A card is unprotected if it has no other cards in front of it within its column. So if my opponent's side looked like this, I could damage this unprotected camp or either of these two people, but not this person because it's protected and neither of these two camps because they're protected as well. And I should mention the effects of an ability can target any column, not just the column that the resolving card is in. If you ever damage a person or camp, you rotate it sideways. And if it's dealt damage when it's already sideways, the card is destroyed. A destroyed person is discarded, but a destroyed camp is flipped face down. So let's say we damaged this garage and then later damaged it again. You would flip it over and now it's destroyed. A punk is also considered to be a person, but it's weaker. And if it ever takes damage, it's immediately destroyed and set back on top of the draw deck. This is the destroy symbol, which lets you skip damaging and get right to the destruction part, though it will usually specify the target. So here we target any camp and immediately flip it face down. Something else I should make clear, if you have an ability that does something negative, like causing damage or destroying, then you have to target an opponent with that. You can never target your own cards. This is the injure symbol, and it's the same as damage, but can only target people. And just as a reminder, punks are also counted as people. Here we have the restore symbol. When this is resolved, you rotate a damaged person or camp upright, so it's no longer damaged. After a person is restored, it's not considered ready. So place an extra water token on it with this symbol face up as a reminder of that. Camps are different. After a camp is restored, it remains ready. So assuming you haven't used one of its abilities already this turn, you still can. Now I should also make clear that once a camp is destroyed, even though it remains in your play area, it cannot be restored. Now let's move on to our next icon. This symbol lets you gain an extra water to use during this turn. When you gain an extra water, you take it from the general supply here and add it to your personal supply. There is no limit to the amount of extra water you can collect during your turn. And in the very, very rare case that you need more water tokens than comes in the game, just use a suitable replacement like some coins. Okay, that brings us to this last icon, which represents a raid. When this symbol is being resolved, you add your Raiders card here to the event queue following the normal event rules. This shows a two, so it will go into the two spot. If your Raider was already in the queue, then anytime you resolve this symbol, you instead advance it forward one space, assuming there's an empty space ahead of it. If not, then it won't move. Now, if it's already at the top position when you would resolve this symbol, you just resolve the event itself. When this event resolves, your opponent must choose one of their camps to damage, even if that camp has protection. So the Raiders are a very effective event as they can get around the protection that your opponent has set up in front of their camps. And after they've taken the damage, you then put the Raiders back in their holding spot here, where it can be played to the event queue again the next time you would resolve a raid symbol. And those are the symbols. You'll find these used in all kinds of unique ways on the cards to create a variety of different effects, which you'll now understand how to interpret when you play. That said, the back of the rulebook has some extra notes on some of the cards in case you aren't exactly sure how they work. And on the other side of your player reference, you'll find reminders of the various symbols used in the game. And with that, we've now gone over the play cards and resolve abilities actions, and that leaves just three actions left to quickly go over. Instead of paying to play a card, you can junk it, which has no cost. You simply resolve the symbol showing in its very top left-hand corner and then discard it. And all of these symbols are ones we learned about earlier. 
Another action you can perform is taking the water silo into your hand. Now, normally this is located here, and to collect it, you spend a water token and put it onto this spot. The water silo can stay in your hand for several turns, but when you're ready, you can junk it, and it will gain you an extra water token from the supply for use during that turn. Collecting the water silo is a great action to perform when you have an extra water to spend, and you're not quite sure what to do with it. After you junk the water silo, return it to this area where you can collect it again later. Now that brings us to the last possible action, drawing a card. Just spend two water, adding them to this area, and then draw a card from the top of the deck. And those are all the actions. Once you've finished taking as many as you can or want to, you collect all of the water tokens in your play area. Black ones are returned to the general supply, and your three white water tokens are returned to your water supply area. Then, the next player goes, and turns will continue back and forth like this, until someone wins. This happens as soon as a player has destroyed all three of their opponent's camps. Now I had mentioned earlier that if the draw deck ever runs out, you reshuffle the discard pile into a new deck. But in the very rare situation that your draw deck runs out a second time, the game just ends in a draw. And that's everything you need to know to play Radlands. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us, you can also join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.